So Mark chapter 2 verses 1 to 12 records an extraordinary, memorable episode in Jesus' ministry. It occurs in uh, Capernaum, apparently at the house of Simon, Peter, and Andrew. A man who cannot walk was carried by four who could. Now our focus verse is going to be verse 3 in this passage. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. When they get to the house, it's, it's overflowing with crowd, but they are determined to get this man before Jesus for healing. So up the outside stairs, they carry him onto the roof, and they proceed to dig out the remaining barrier between them and Jesus. Jesus. Now, a typical oriental roof at that time was constructed with wood beams and then some cross branches or lath covered over with uh, a, a mortar that would be of tar and ashes and sand. And then it would be rolled or pressed down so that it was flat and that you could walk on it. Opening up a hole in such a roof, large enough to lower a man through on a mat, was no small project. And in fact, it would have meant some considerable dust and debris to those who were down below. Many have wondered how the homeowners felt about this intrusion. (laughs) Whether or not this kind of roof damage was covered in their Mutual of Galilee home insurance. Is that in the policy? So you have these folks trying to dig through. And Mark doesn't record any rebuke coming from down below. And apparently, Jesus didn't mind the interruption either. It would have taken a while. And then he incorporates that into his ministry. In fact, the arc of this passage really emphasizes how Jesus has authority to pronounce forgiveness for sin. He is Lord of sin and sickness. Right? Lord of both. And he goes on to heal the man, the paralyzed man, to give both spiritual and physical wholeness. Here's what Mark has to say. When Jesus returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. So many gathered there that there was no longer room for them, not even in front of the door, and he was speaking the word to them. Then some people came, bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. And when they could not bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And after having dug through it, they let down the the mat on which the paralytic lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this fellow speak in this way? It is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And at once Jesus perceived in his spirit that they were discussing this question among themselves. And he said to them, why do you raise such questions in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up. Take your mat and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, stand up, take your mat, and go to your home. And he stood up and immediately took the mat and went out before all of them so that they were all amazed and glorified God saying, we have never seen anything like this. Hmm. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, there is no one like you. You alone have the authority to pronounce forgiveness and the power to heal. Behind both of those is the divine love that stretches into forever. Teach us and empower us 
to be part of your loving network so that the church, your body, is filled with forgiveness and wholeness. We pray to your glory. Amen. Throughout the Lenten season, we were focused on one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. And in fact, we could use that same um, approach even to this passage, though not so fruitfully. And I'd rather use a different lens. Instead of one-on-one -on -one with Jesus, I'd like to use the one another love that Jesus prescribes. On his last night, in his final supper with the disciples, he gave them a new commandment to love one another. He says, this, this is the command I, I have for you. A and he tells them, by this, love for one another. Everyone will know that you are my disciples. Now, in other moments, Jesus taught loving God with all our heart and soul and strength and mind, with everything we've got. In other moments, Jesus taught loving neighbor, loving stranger, loving even enemies. But not here. In the, in the waning hours of his earthly life, he wants to make sure that his closest followers have the essence of his message. It's love, and it has to start at the center of our relationships. And so he says, love one another. This love one another is a characteristic of Jesus' followers. It's essential for our reputation, for our witness to Jesus. One another is, is a reciprocal pronoun. It, it simply means there's a notion of mutuality. Those of us who acclaim Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we participate in a love that's never unilateral in, in community. It, it's, it's something that goes both ways. We are in a matrix of love that goes back and forth and it's multi-directional and we call it church. This matrix or network of love, it's what he desires. He wants us to exhibit and experiencing a, a reciprocating love. Paul wrote to the Christians at Rome, he said, owe no one anything except to love one another. Don't carry any debt except the ongoing debt to love each other. That's something that's always there. We owe each other that all the time. So with that in mind, I want to lift up the beautiful example that's in Mark 2. Then some people came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Some people came. Mark writes, some people. He doesn't specify how many came. He only says that there were four of them. When they arrived, there were four who were carrying him. But more than four were bringing him. Perhaps they took turns in shifts of four, carrying the stretcher. Or maybe they had other roles as they went. some might have been carrying food or water. One of them might have known the way to the house and, and into the neighborhood. Another, uh, you know, maybe some were just coming alongside and walking with encouragement. Let's refer to the entire company as stretcher bearers. They were working together to transport the man. They had the collective capacity to do what he could not do himself. They had the collective determination to deal with obstacles, first the crowd, then the stairs, then a roof, even the lowering. They had an impressive commitment to this man. They were undeterred, these stretcher bearers. Wouldn't you love to have them on your side? I mean, I would. Love to have him on, on my side. And what Jesus saw in them was their faith. The passage doesn't say Jesus saw their compassion. It doesn't say Jesus saw their empathy. It doesn't say he saw their commitment to their friend. No, it says he saw their faith. 
They had a faith to make something happen and be a part of it. Jesus elsewhere had told us that faith, even the size of a mustard seed, can move mountains. You may have heard that around here before. In fact, we, we even said that our theme for the year and our stewardship would be move the mountain based on Jesus saying just a little bit of faith can move mountains. Well, these guys have enough faith that they can move the man and raise the roof. And it's no wonder that Jesus takes it from there. He appreciates their faithfulness. And stretcher bearers help to carry the load of another. They show up when there's a crisis. They're ready to, to give a hand and give a lift. They're also ready to lower gently. We don't want somebody falling through the cracks. Well, let's, let's be in a position where we can lower someone gently before the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. When and how are you a stretcher bearer for someone else? And who are the stretcher bearers for you? Most of us would rather be stretcher bearers than the one on the stretcher. <laughs> I know I would. I've, I've been both. I can enumerate times when I've been on the stretcher. I'll save that for another Sunday. But believe me, I've, I've been on the stretcher. And opening ourselves to receiving help from somebody else is, is a key part of the one another love experience that Jesus wants for us. It goes both ways. Now, the man on the stretcher had to acknowledge his need for help. He had to admit he needed help. And then he had to be willing to accept it. That can be the biggest obstacle. That can be a huge one. Because we so much want to be the stretcher bearer, a lot of times we may refuse to be the one who's on the stretcher when we really need it. That man who was on the stretcher, I mean, he's jostled for a long time. How long, we don't know. Then he has the experience of being carried upstairs. Hopefully they, they knew to carry him up head first. That would have been an interesting experience, being carried up, you know, with narrow steps on the side of the house and, then he's waiting on the roof while the others are digging, scooping it out. And, and, and then he gets the experience of, well, let's tie ropes on four corners of this mat and let's lower him down. You know, I love this cartoon, which shows him looking anxiously over the edge of the, like, oh, <laughs> all right, let's keep this level. <laughs> Certainly Jesus would have seen the, the faith of the man as well as those who carried him. Love one another involves giving and receiving a hand. Heard of a, a golfer who was well into his 70s who showed up at the course, as he often did, just looking to get matched up with somebody to play a round of golf. And there was a younger golfer who was there who was always looking to find a game and take some money on the course. But he was honest. He said, you know, he said, I'd, I'd love to play a round of golf with you. How many strokes should I give you? And the older golfer and veteran said, I don't think I'll need any. I'm playing pretty well. My only struggle is I just have a little trouble getting out of the sand traps. But other than that, I'm fine. And the golfer, they, they, you know, they said, all right, let's have an even match. And in fact, it was very even. It was dead even right to the 18th hole. The approach shot for the young golfer at the, in the last hole, he, he knocks it stiff about 20 feet from the pin, smiles as he realizes he's got a good roll at a birdie. And then the older golfer loses it just a bit to the right, drops into a sand trap beside the green. That younger golfer couldn't quite hide his smile. <laughs> and they get up there, and the older golfer steps awkwardly down into the sand trap, and without wasting any time, he grinds his heels into the sand and addresses the ball and takes a mighty swing, and Wow, that ball lofts up, 
it lands gently on the green. And the young golfer watches with amazement as the ball rolls eight feet and just kisses the pin and drops in. <laughs> Whoa! He walks toward the man and says, nice shot. But I thought you told me you had trouble getting out of sand traps. I do, said the veteran golfer, still in the bunker. Would you please give me a hand up? <laughs> Sometimes we need a lift. We need a hand up, right? Sometimes we need others' hands to carry us. And friends, sometimes it's our hand that has to be on the stretcher. So let's use this image in a, in a loose way, this metaphor. Let's just use this for a moment to think about what is the experience and the system of caregiving that you and I are part of. Stretcher bearers. First, and, and by the way, uh, this is in the bulletin, and, and so if you can't read it, there'll be uh, something you can take with you that it has it there. At one corner, we can place our family and friends. Um, you know, I, I love being here at Northlake. I was telling friends this past week, I cannot believe how wonderful the first eight and a half months have been here. Just been wonderful. But I'll say to you, I would not be here if it were not for God wanting me to be a stretcher bearer for my family. It's, it's, it's the reason that I sensed a call away from where I had been that opened me up to the possibility of coming to be serving in this great congregation. Because my parents live, as most of you know by now, only 20 minutes away from here, 11 miles door to door. In fact, when my wife Bobby is not sitting right here at the 945 service, 95% of the time it's because she's gone to get my parents and to bring them to the 1115 service, which is the case for this morning. And, and, and so we, we understand what it's like to have these familial connections where we are stretcher bearers with each other. Oh my goodness, how many times have my parents carried me on the stretcher? <laughs> and, and our son and his wife and, and our granddaughter live less than an hour away. So it's, it's all about learning how, we, how can we be stretcher bearers within our own circle of family and friends. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm just back from this trip to California, which included a wonderful few days with our other son and his fiance. Their wedding will be next month. I, by the way, I get to officiate at that. It'll be the third of three that I'll do for our three kids. I'm sure I'll lose it again. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. But the, but, but the time I also included a conference with uh, a national covenant group of clergy that I've been a part of for more than 17 years. Now, we capped the group uh, in terms of size so that it's easier to get a, a lodging and logistics um, so we have just under 50 members. But my small group is six. And, and um, we have faced many, many personal and professional crises together. These guys are my stretcher bearers. Steve and Glenn and Steve and Keith and Jeff, th these are my stretcher bearers. And it's, it's, we can all attest to how we've been stretcher bearers for each other in various things that we've gone through. And I, I imagine over the years ahead, you'll hear more about some of the things we've tackled. One, one of them has told me that I saved his life, literally and figuratively. And that's what stretcher bearers do, right? That's, that's what we do. And, and I could say the same in terms of ways in which I've been blessed and cared for. Hopefully, you have stretcher bearers in your own circle of family and friends. I hope you do. And what I know for sure is you can cultivate that. You can, you can do your part to promote that stretcher bearing within your family and within your circle of friends. I hope you will. That's one corner. A second corner is the relationships with North Lake friends. Um, and we want these to reflect that 
one another love that Jesus prescribes. By the way, the spontaneous, natural expression of care that happens when, you know, I've, I've seen it for band members. You know, when, when somebody had a crisis in the band. I don't know, I don't know if Ralph is a crisis or not, but... But I really like this with one hand. I was good. <laughs> but serious, seriously, I have watched choir members and band members and folks in Sunday school classes and circles and other mission teams or when they, folks have been together on a mission project, and there'll be very spontaneous expressions of care. So there'll be an outpouring when something happens. I've watched it. It's been a blessing already to see this occur when folks rally around somebody who's had a, a, a death or surgery, or some other crisis. Beautiful to behold. Look, as a pastor who feels responsible for 1,500 and more, it is a profound joy for me whenever I see God's people taking care of each other, prompted by the Spirit of Christ as a part of the existing connections of the church. That is such a joy. That, that's what we would hope as a, one of these corners. And by the way, we would say to new members and, and frankly to everybody, the very obvious principle, the more that you work to develop the connections with others, the more actively engaged you are with others, then the more you will feel that sense of caring and that outpouring when most you need it. It's a, it's a very natural, that's that reciprocating love uh, that, that Jesus talks about. Third, we have care ministries that are specifically designed as stretcher bearers for North Lake folks uh, and those who are beyond our community. Our Stephen ministers, for example, have, have extensive training uh, to provide one-on-one -on -one confidential, confidential care, listening, support, uh, we have a tremendous team of Stephen ministers. The, the grief support group is just one example of, of a small group process where people become stretcher bearers for each other. I just heard from one of our members whose husband died a year ago, January, and she said, oh my goodness, you were just talking about our group uh, and the small group that she's been in where they have been stretcher bearers for each other over the last 14, 15 months. I can tell you, North Lake does as fine a job in prayer support as any church I've ever seen anywhere. I can say to you, if you submit an intercessory prayer request, I know that there will be a prayer chain, there will be a team who is carrying those prayers with you and for you. And next Sunday, as, as Pastor Mike already mentioned, there will be a, a healing service. And, and there will be stretcher bearers here at 4 o'clock next Sunday who want to help present folks who need to be brought before Christ for healing of any kind. I love the passion. By the way, you can, you can read about all the North Lake Congregational Care Ministries at the website. There's a list and description of all of them, or you can just ask in the church office. Um, we've, they've been in print. They've been in the um, newsletter from time to time. But I love the passion and the energy that Lynn Miller brings to this. She is our elder for congregational care, and she writes... When I look into the face of another, I see God's creation. I want to treat that person with the same respect and love that I would treat our Lord and Savior. We are united with Christ through faith. Let's keep our eyes always on the Lord with warm hearts before God and loving hands toward one another. Let's commit to caring for each other. She invites all of us to be stretcher bearers to find ways to be a part of that. If there's something you may be interested in doing or want to learn more about, or if there's a special need that you have that you'd like to find out, how do I address that within this community? You can start by calling Lynn through the church office or, or with our pastoral staff to just say, I want to know how I can do this, be a part of this stretcher-bearing stretcher ministry. Now, fourth, the remaining corner is, is the... North Lake pastoral staff, Dan, Dave, Mike, and myself. And I want to 
I want to go into that substantially uh, with a message next Sunday, so I'll leave it mostly for that. But I, I want you to know, please know, that pastoral ministry is what I have been about for the last 35 years. I do not identify myself primarily as a preacher. Never have. I think of myself as a pastor who preaches, and there's a difference. And I want very much, now, by the way, I'm aware of my gifts and my limitations, especially as I serve here at Northway. But I aspire to excellence for our congregational care. I want for that stretcher bearing mentality and our care for each other. I want that one another love to be a hallmark of North Lake Presbyterian Church. Look, we have a fabulous building and campus. Anytime somebody comes here for the first time, I'm bound to hear somebody say, wow, I love your facilities. Beautiful. And they are. But I want us to be known not only for the care of our facilities, but also and even more so for the care of our people. And I will tell you that when I hear that, when somebody says, wow, you have a beautiful church, I want to be able to say always that the care of this building is just an indicator of the way we want to care for the souls who are growing in this place. That's the calling, I think, that we have together, to be that one another community. And it takes work. It's not easy, especially in a church of this size and with our demographics. It's not easy. But this is exactly what Jesus says. And when we talk about moving the mountain, Part of that means addressing our congregational care systems and growing it in ways that really bless the Lord. Let's grow our one another love. That's what Jesus commands. Let me finish with what John Ortberg says. Author John Ortberg puts it very well. He says, I told God I would like to be in training to love people better. I think of how I want to be remembered when I reach the end of my life. I would like to have looked deeply into many eyes, to connect deeply with many souls, to have people know that I noticed them and cared about them and actually loved them. Let's be in training to love better. God, you know us and you, you love us deeply. Lord, train us to love better, and not just on Sunday mornings. May our one another love bear witness to you and to the example you've given in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has shown us what it's like, what it means to love one another. So in his name, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh...